Hello, it is so good to be with you, to talk to you about uh, a subject that I am so encouraged to talk to you about, and that is the subject of evangelism. I just want to take this time to, if you don't mind, to, to thank you, to thank you for your dedication, to take, thank you for your commitment to spend some time uh, watching these videos to better prepare ourselves to reaching the loss. And I just, I just hope that I am an encouragement to you. I, I pray that I do a good job in teaching these lessons, making them simple and understandable so that we can go out and reach the lost. We're going to be using our workbook during this study. Uh, one of the nice things about this workbook is, is that not only will we use this workbook as a guide through the, through the studies that we're going to do in these 24 videos, but also when we get done with these videos, you can use this as a, as a guide to go out and reach people, sit across the table uh, and study with them. And that's what this workbook is designed for, saving souls in the 21st century. I want to tell you a little bit about the book, but before we do that, I would like you to turn to the introduction. Um, it's, not a, it's not a page number. It's right at the beginning. So if you could look for the introduction and the purpose of this workbook. I'd like to read what I've written here. Does everybody have it? The purpose of this workbook is to better equip Christians in reaching people for Jesus. My hope is to make this workbook as easy enough for any Christian to answer what I believe are the most asked questions by people who are truly seeking after God in our world today. This book is in no way to become a substitute for the Bible. Only use this workbook as an aid to help people better understand God's plan from the Bible for the salvation of their souls. This workbook contains over 700 printed verses of the Bible to show our students God's Word and how it applies to these important subjects. I have chosen four translations of the Bible, the English Standard Version, the New King James Version, the New American Standard Version, and the New International Version, trying to use the best version to convey the meaning of the text and at the same time making it understandable to the reader. There is also over 800 references of Scripture, all in the hopes of showing our friends that this is not us coming up with these ideas, but that it comes from God's Word. Above all, please remember that when you became a Christian, there was someone who taught you about the love of Jesus. Therefore, God needs you to be that someone in others' lives. Find people who need what you know and teach them. We may be their only chance. And if you would, I would like you to turn your Bibles over here to Acts chapter 8. I think we're pretty familiar with the story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. But I want you to look down here at verse 30. There's a very important verse here, and I think it really applies to the study. Then Philip ran up to the chariot, heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said unless somebody explains it to me. That's where we come in at, to explain to people the love of Jesus from the Word of God. If you would, I'd also like to tell you a little bit about this book and how it works. I have a very good friend, his name is Kevin Bethea, and he gave me some ideas of, when putting this book together, that I should put some instructions in this, in this workbook so people will know how to use it and where the place is to go. So if you would, turn to page 3. And let's go through, through these. I, I have five steps here that I, I believe will be helpful in using this book. Step number one on page 3. Read this workbook. That is so important for us to understand the subjects that people are asking about today. So please take some time and really get to know this workbook. One man said when I was doing an evangelism workshop, he said, get this workbook and put it in your library. I said, no, don't do that. When, work, when books go into the library, that's usually where they stay. Use this workbook. I, I believe you'll really find it interesting and it'll be very helpful in our, in our work on evangelism. Step number two, pray for the people that you're personally involved with and trying to reach for Jesus. And we're going to talk about that subject in just a minute. 
the importance of prayer. And I believe that's where evangelism should start, involving God. Step number three, get to know the person you're studying with. Form a good relation, friendship with them and show them that you truly care about them and their needs. Then find out where they are at in relation with God and their knowledge of God's Word. I really believe in, in, in friendship evangelism. We have to get to know people. We have to get to know people and where they're at and, and what they're thinking and get to know their backgrounds. This is so vitally important. Step number four. Let me give some words of advice in my years of studying with people. Teach the truth, but make sure you teach it in love. Please do not come across to your student as knowing it all. Show humility and let the person you are studying with know that you are in just as much in need of the saving blood of Jesus as anyone else. People will respect you more if they understand that you are not above them. Teach the truth, but teach it in love. We've got to show love and true concern for people. And that's so important because if we don't, they're going to be able to see right through us and they're not going to listen. And step number five. Once you know your student well, take them to the place or places of this workbook that apply to their needs the most. Don't overteach. You could lead someone to Christ and then confuse them with too much information on a subject, possibly losing them. Understand that our United States has a lot of people in it. Thus you have a wide spectrum of people with differing beliefs and backgrounds. There should be something within this workbook for just about everyone you meet. That is the reason for so much material. Remember the goal of your study, salvation, salvation, salvation. There are 38 individual studies in this workbook. And they, they are all across the board as far as subjects. There's a lot of material in here. But just make sure that you take the person to the places that they need and don't overteach. And always remember the goal of this study is salvation. Now when we get into our next study, we're going to look at eight vital studies that I believe are important for every potential believer. And those are listed right here on page four. And then our last section of, of this study, we're going to look at some other studies that are in this book. And you're going to find those on pages five and pages six. And these may be studies that an individual may need because of the place that they're in. And so that hopefully this will help and give you some guidance on how to use this workbook. Let's get back to that subject of prayer. If you would, turn to page 11. Let's turn our Bibles, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. I want you to see what Paul says here. In verse 1 he says, I urge you then first of all that prayers, requests, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. Paul says first of all, or of first importance. What's of first importance? Prayer. And who are we to pray for? Everyone. From kings and queens right down to the, to the lowest person in the world living in the, in, in the street somewhere. We are to pray for everybody. And then, what are we to pray for? We are to pray for their souls. He wants all men to be saved. When we pray, we're supposed to pray according to the will of God. Now, you may have a lot of requests and a lot of things that you pray for. Maybe finances or people's health or uh, maybe even for the weather, like for some rain here in Lubbock. And it's hard to know the will of God on a lot of subjects. But here's one that we can be sure of. We can be sure of that the will of God is that all men be saved. That is a guarantee. And so we can make sure that when we pray for souls, that this is something that God wants. And we see that also in 2 Peter, that he wants all men to come to repentance and the knowledge of truth so that they can be saved. 
I want you to think about Matthew for a minute. I want you to turn over here to Matthew chapter 6. We know this section as a Lord's Prayer. I want you to look at Matthew chapter 6. Now you may have heard this prayer recited at funerals or in a football game or a basketball game. I don't believe that this prayer was ever intended to be recited word for word. I believe what, what Jesus is trying to do is he's trying to get us to think. Think before you pray. Think while you pray. And so what does he say here in verse 9? He says, this is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And it continues. Just think about that. When we pray, who are we praying to? Our Father. He's our Father. He created us. That ought to really spike up our prayers. That ought to really get us connected to the one we're praying to. And then he says, our Father in heaven. Where does our Father live at? He's in heaven. We're down here on earth. Tell me about his personality. What is his character like? He is hallowed. He is holy. He is righteous. He has nothing to do with sin. He'll never compromise sin. He'll never do you any wrong. In fact, the Bible says he'll never leave you or forsake you. So God is holy. He is righteous. But then it comes down to talking again about his will. Look at his will. He says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Again, what is God's will? God's will is that he wants his kingdom to come. Now, where is God's kingdom? Have you ever thought about that? God's kingdom is anywhere where he reigns. Now, he reigns in heaven, correct? So his kingdom is there. But what about here on earth? Is his kingdom here? Well, yes, in some places. Wherever you find a Christian, when a person is baptized, they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and God indwells them. And God's kingdom, that's why, that's why our body is called the temple, God reigns there. So his kingdom has come to that person. But what about all the people that are not Christians, that have not come to Christ? Has the kingdom come yet? Not yet. And that's, that's what Jesus is trying to get us to pray. He wants us to be about the will of God, to get our minds to think and be on the same page that God is. God wants his kingdom to come. And how is that kingdom going to come? By us taking the message out, people responding to that gospel message from the Word of God, obeying it, and becoming a child of God. So that is God's will. So let's, when we pray, let's make sure that we're in line with the will of God. If you go back to your workbooks, let's look at that first paragraph on page 11. The very first and most important thing that must be done in evangelism is prayer. I cannot uh, stress this point enough. Prayer shows commitment, seriousness, and concern for the people that we are trying to reach for Jesus. Make a commitment to the lost people around you. Do your very best to pray every day for the people of your world. Set a time during the day to get, get in, and get into a routine to pray for the people you put on your daily prayer list. I want you to think about this for a minute. Why, why do we pray? Why do we pray? Doesn't God already know the things that we are going to ask of Him before we ask? Absolutely. Prayer, it shows commitment. It shows faith. God wants to hear from His children. But have you ever thought that prayer is also for us? Think about this for a minute. If you pray for somebody, and say you, you, you st you're, you're laying in bed and you're thinking about them. Have you ever, have you ever done this before, where you're, you're thinking about the person in your mind and you're picturing that person? Maybe they're a person at work. You're picturing them at their desk. Uh, maybe you're picturing them at home. Um, and then all of a sudden you start to, to think about this person and you think about their home, and you think about their dog, and before you know it, you fall asleep, 
and I have done that so many times. If we are praying for someone who's sick, that's going to change us because the next time I see them, I'm going to think about them and their needs. They've been in the hospital. They haven't been able to work. And so, so thinking about them and them being sick is going to actually change me and how I respond to them. This prayer list is not for people who are sick. This prayer list is not for people who are in financial need or their marriages or things like that. This prayer list is for the lost of your world, the people of your world. See, my neighbors aren't your neighbors. My coworkers aren't your coworkers. The people that are in my family are not the people that are in your family. We need to be praying for these people and pray for them for evangelism, pray for them for salvation. If we think of them as being lost, that's going to change us. Because the next time that I see them, I'm going to picture them as being lost. They don't have Jesus in their lives. They have not obeyed the gospel. They are not Christians. And what that's going to do is that's going to change me and how I respond to them the next time I see them. And so I'm going to start looking for openings. I'm going to start looking for maybe something they say or, or a conversation that they bring up so I can maybe bring God into the picture. And if we pray for that, God will bless us and give us those opportunities. Put on this list the people of your world, the neighbors, the friends, your family members, anyone you know, the people that bag your groceries, uh, your doctors. Um, I've had Bible studies with uh, the dentist. What a perfect spot, right? The, I'm not going anywhere and they're not going anywhere. We, we've actually had conversations about the Bible. Pray for these people and pray also for you that you make the most of these opportunities. Could you imagine if the church, there's, if you turn the pages here, you're going to see there, there's, there's about four pages where you can put names of people. Could you imagine if the church, every individual inside the church was praying for 50, 60, 100, maybe even 1,000 individuals every day for salvation. Do you think that would change things? Do you think more people would be saved? Paul says, of first importance, pray for everyone so that their souls may be saved. Let's go back to our workbooks here. Here's some of the things that I personally pray for when it comes to salvation. Number one, that I make myself available to the people that I become personally involved in their lives. And I become personally involved in their lives. Again, we, we need to get to know people. We're a busy people. We've got a lot going on in our lives, but we need to make ourselves available and really get to know people so that we can reach them for Jesus. Number two, that God opens up a door of conversation and that I be given the wisdom and the courage to take advantage of these opportunities. So many times we have opportunities. We see people in the stores, we're, we're busy, we're getting our groceries, but do we ever take time to talk to them about God? And they'll bring the subject up, especially if you're praying about it. Open up those hearts, Lord. Please open up those conversations so we can be ready to go to them. Number three, this is the third thing I pray for. For the, for the people that we're studying with or the people that are in our worlds, that their hearts be open to God and His saving message. Not everybody's heart is open. We, we saw that um, in the last study when we looked at Isaiah. It says, when, remember in Isaiah chapter 6, he said, go take this message. Their, their hearts will be callous. Their eyes will be closed. Let's pray that God open up their eyes and open up their hearts, that he works in their lives, causes things to happen in their lives so they'll be receptive to the gospel message. And number five, finally, pray, I pray for myself to do a good job in studying his word so that I may be properly prepared in what to say. And here's what the Apostle Paul says in Colossians chapter 4, verse 2 through 6. Let's turn our Bibles over to Colossians chapter 4 and see if this prayer 
doesn't have evangelism written all over it. Colossians chapter 4, verse 2. Paul says, devote yourself to prayer. Again, prayer is important, isn't it? Being watchful and thankful. And pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message. There it is. So that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way that you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. There's so much in this prayer, isn't there? Pray that a door be open for our message, that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, Pray that we proclaim it clearly as we should, right? We have to be clear about this. Hopefully this workbook is made simple and easy. If we can understand the subjects of the Bible, we can go out and teach people those subjects. But make it simple. Make it simple. And then he says, be wise in the way that you act towards outsiders. Use a little tact. Make sure that you are kind in those stores. Make sure that uh, we're not doing things that are ungodly because people are watching what we're putting in our, our grocery baskets and they're, they're, they're watching us, how we act towards our wives and how we treat our children. Make sure that we act good towards people also. Make the most of every opportunity. God gives us so many opportunities. Let's make the most of every one of them. Let your conversation always be full of grace, love, kindness, Season with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Again, just a, a short story about my grandma and my mother. Both of them were praying for me every day, all of my life. I had left the church. I had went and worked for Budweiser. When you're warehouse manager, that's the cheapest bar in town. I was drinking every day. I was living such an ungodly life. And, and my mom and my grandma, they would come and tell me, I need to get back to church. I need to get back to the Lord. And I'd say, yeah, Mom, sure, whatever. But one thing I knew, they were praying for me. They prayed for me every single day. God put me down, and He put me down hard those prayers were answered. When I was in Germany, when you get off the, the Bonhof, um, right there in, in, in Frankfurt, Germany, you get off the train, you walk across the street, you can't walk across the street in Frankfurt, you have to take an escalator down. You have to walk underneath the road and then back up. One day, we went down a little bit farther. And we found that there was another escalator and there was another train down on the second level. That there was another escalator and it went down and it went down and it went down. I think there were six different levels underneath that that I never knew existed. I never knew that I could be so low. And God put me down. The prodigal son, that story of Luke chapter 15, God made it hurt. And he made it hurt so bad, I had nowhere else to go but up. Do you know that God was answering those prayers of my mother and my grandmother? And I am so thankful, and I praise God for making sin hurt so bad. And so I had nowhere else to go but towards him. Prayer is powerful. Prayer is effective. I pray that you've been encouraged, and I pray that you have the faith to pray for the lost people of your world. Again, they may be our only chance. Let's go win some souls for Jesus.